Okay. How are you doing today? Okay, we're all good. Mm. We uh, got a chance to read a lot of stuff waiting for the call. Okay, thanks. <laughs> well, I certainly appreciate your calling. Okay. Mm. Yeah, boy, I had a hell of a day yesterday. I was calling a lot of people, asking them what to ask you, you know, to try to get, you know, a real feel for the questions of what everybody wanted to know. Uh-huh. And um, I guess, like, the first question would be, what do you enjoy most about being a member of KISS? What do I enjoy most? Yeah, somebody said the first thing he's going to say is the girls. <laughs> That's actually not true. <laughs> That's second. Oh, yeah. That's the second. I think the thing that, you know, that I enjoy, are you taping this or just writing it or what? Oh, I'm going to tape it if it's okay. Okay. Are you taping? Yes. Okay. Then I better watch what I say. I can't say fuck or anything like that, right? Oh, okay. Um, no, the thing, the thing I really like most about KISS is just, uh, you know, for me getting into KISS was like the culmination of everything that I had wanted to do, you know, for my whole life. I mean, ever since I started playing drums, I always wanted to be famous, you know, and I wanted to be in a famous band, you know, and at first it was, you know, at first it was the Beatles, because that's what got me started playing, and then uh, it really wasn't anybody else, I never kind of felt that way uh, about any other band, you know, thinking like, boy, I wish I was in that band, you know, even even though I loved Zeppelin a lot, you know, but I never kind of pictured myself, in there. I just thought they were great, and I wished I could play like John, Bo- you know, Bonham. And that was more for the visual thing than anything else because I didn't really know as much of the music, you know, as, as I might have. But I was like that with lots of bands, you know, I, I would love them, but I really wouldn't know all the stuff. But the thing that I always loved about them and no other band had it was that they were all individuals, you know, and you knew each guy's name. Um, there, was, there was nobody that was faceless in the band, you know, there wasn't just one or two major guys. Everybody in the band had a, a purpose and had their own character and personality, and you knew who they were, you know, and they had their own fans, plus the, the fans of the band. So, when I started getting into, into the Kiss and into the visual thing, that was my second um, ideal situation. So I, I wish I could be in a band that looked that good, you know, and I never expected that I would actually get, be given a chance to get into the band. So, I think, um, you know, it, it's everything. I mean, getting into Kiss is just what I've always wanted to do. It really is. Musically, uh, personality-wise, girl-wise, money-wise, you know, no matter how you look at it, I mean, in every respect, it's the band that I wanted to be in and that I was trying to be in for the last, like, 19 years. Well, then that brings me to the next question, then. Um, how would you actually describe your role or the status that you have in KISS? It's like, um... My you, role? Well, you know how, like, you always... Butter and... <laughs> Well, you always know how you read, like, the magazines, um, they try to make it the Stanley Simmons band. Yeah. And um, a lot of people just don't seem to understand that you have just as much an equal part. Sure. Well, you know, what's happened is that Gene and Paul obviously are the, are the focal points uh, because, you know, they're, they're two original guys, and they share a lot more of the burden as far as, like, um, things that, that don't directly pertain to the band, okay? So their, their um, exposure, you know, reflects that. They, they are involved in, in much more things than even me or Bruce are, and it's because, you know, those are things that don't directly relate to the band as a band, okay? Yeah. Um, they, oh God, you know, the magazines, as far as that's concerned, they can't, they will only do what they think, magazines will only do what they think is the right thing to do for the magazine, mm-hmm. you know, and so if, if it seems as though Gene and Paul are getting more exposure and they're the more, most important things in the band, other magazines will follow suit and pursue that line of thinking. Um, in the last, you know, six months or so, or seven, eight months, whatever, it's really gotten to that point where it's, you know, it seems like it's the Stanley Simmons band, you don't really hear much about me, uh, you're hearing a little about Bruce now because, you know, he's the newer guy, so you're getting that, that publicity there, but, you know, I, I mean, I can't lie, I resent the fact that, you know, I read uh, articles where I'm just kind of like glanced over or uh, I'm put together as, you know, as one of the new members of KISS, you know, not people not realizing that I've been with the band for five years, which is a hell of a long time, it's, it's much longer than lots of bands stay together, mm-hmm. and, and I've had a big part, which is sometimes it's difficult to, uh, to kind of, you know, it's kind of difficult to pinpoint what it is, but, you know, my, my, inf- 
influence has been felt ever since the beginning. Um, you know, hopefully that'll change with the new album and stuff. You know, drummers, drummers are always second-class citizens. I mean, they really are. No matter what you do, they, no matter how important they are. A perfect example is John Bonham. You know, it's only now that he's dead and that Zeppelin's broken up and that other drummers are talking about their idols and their influences. You know, that everybody's kind of respecting Bonzo for the great drummer that he really was. But even even by the band's own um, design, if you ever see Song Remains the Same, the movie, <coughs> Bonzo, I mean, is not even shown, I would say, 80% of the time, you don't even see him, you know? And yeah. it was basically just Page and Plant, which is great, but, you know, I'd like to see the drummer, too. I mean, he's holding the band together. Anyway, I think I went off on a tangent there, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I got it. Okay. My role in the band is, you know, it's the same as it's always been. I mean, I have I have an equal say uh, with Gina Paul. I, you know, I it's not even something that's like we, we agreed on, you know, okay, you will have an equal say, you will do this. You know, it's nothing like that. It's just we're a band and we're friends and we respect each other's opinion. And if there's something that, that I think sounds great, you know, or an idea that I hear that, uh, let's say on a vocal or a bass part or a guitar part, you know, that I think is good, better than what's being played, I'll suggest it. Um, when, if, if I'm playing something that they like, or if I'm playing something that they don't like, and they have a better idea, they'll tell me that, you know. So we kind of, we put down the egos, you know, a lot of the time, and we just work to get the best sounding records and the best sound in concert, and we just try to make, you know, Kiss sound the best that it can. But, um, as I said, you know, as far as band, band business is concerned and music and the staging and the, and the visual and all that stuff, I have just as much to say as Gina Paul does. You know? Well, are you very close with the other guys then? Sure. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, there was a certain, a certain chemistry that happened between us from the very beginning. I mean, from my, ver my first audition already, I felt really relaxed with the guys and, you know, as, as relaxed as you can feel with people that you've never seen before and that you, and you think are gods, you know. You can't, you can't be totally relaxed. But it was just uh, the senses of humor, you know, were so alike that that was like a common, a common ground. And that kind of like helped things just move along, you know. And the fact that when I auditioned for the band, I, you know, I knew the songs better than they did. And it's like, I, you know, I was playing all the parts and I was singing all the right harmonies. and. You know, I would hear mistakes and I would look at them like, you know, what the fuck are you doing, you know? <laughs> so uh, that kind of gave me, you know, it kind of like put me right into the band already. Because I was hearing mistakes and I was saying, boy, this doesn't sound good, that doesn't sound good, what are you guys doing? You know? So what's it like to play in Kiss then, with a band like them? What was it like then? Well, what's it like now or then, you know? I mean, what's it like in general to play with a band like Kiss? It's great, you know? It's, boy, how, you know, how do you describe it? I mean, it's my band. You know, it's my band. That's the band that I play in. You know, we, we love playing with each other. Um, you know, we get off playing. We have a lot of the same musical influences, so we, we uh, jam and we fool around with things. You know, we all enjoy it. And it's really fun. There's a chemistry that works, you know, and it's not just the music um, on stage. We, you know, we watch each other. We, if anybody fucks up, you know, we cover for each other. Um, we enhance things. If, if somebody's really getting off on something, you know, great and really getting into it, you know, everybody else will respond to it. It's not like we're all up there doing doing it for ourselves. You know, we're, we're a band and we feel like a band. And it's fun. I enjoy it. I, I love it. As a matter of fact, when I'm off tour, I mean, I was, you know, everyone was kind of tired after this tour because it was a really long tour. But I was like, you know, I was just about ready to cry when the tour was over because, you know, I missed it. I, w I would play forever if I could. It's not the way it is. Well, have you written any material then for the new album? No, not for the new one. I mean, I wrote material for the new album, but it didn't make it to the album. Oh, okay, then. Um, well, how would you describe the new album? Round, with a hole in it. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's great. Well, it's yeah, called... It's good. <laughs> yeah, it's called a song, right? Uh, I don't know. Well, they... I mean, actually... that's, the, that's kind of the title that everybody seems to be agreeing on. I'm not crazy about it, you know, but... I guess it's just one of those things you got to get used to. You know, everybody else seems to think it's great. You know, anybody that we've told or, or you know, has mentioned it, asked about it, thinks it's a great title. Yeah, a lot of the fans do, too. Yeah, um, uh -huh. so, well, they you know, just... that's really what counts. I mean, you know, it's just a matter of personal taste. You know, when I first heard it, I, it didn't, it didn't 
you can knock me out, you know. It takes time uh, to grow on you. Huh? It takes time to grow on you. Yeah, that's all, you know, but that's, that's just my, my opinion. Um, but the album, okay, this album is really, you know, lick it up. I mean, these albums have been progressing, okay? Creatures of the Night was really like just turning around from, I think, uh, yeah, I think Creatures of the Night was really the new kiss kind of breaking out of the shell of the old and saying, well, that was one era of the band, that was one sound. We, you know, kind of got too pop, and then we went ahead and made a mistake and did The Elder, even though it's a great album, everybody loves it, and I love it also. It just was not right for us to do it at the time, you know. Um, and I was like dead set against it, you know, I really... I told, you know, I was against cutting the hair and the costuming and the whole idea of the album at first. But, you know, I was talked down. And then, uh, you know, the time proved me right, but I was guilty also because I, once I got into the album, I, you know, I enjoyed it just as much as everybody else. And I was really, really happy with it. You know, it just wasn't right for us. But I think that was, I think that was the end of the era of the old Kiss right there. And then Creatures was us turning around with me prodding them, saying, you know, and telling them how much I love Led Zeppelin and how much I love John Bonham and get big drum sound. So that's what me and Gene did, you know, we, we got, we developed that sound, which that's my favorite album so far, except maybe for this new one. Well, what would you, um, well, what do you think of that reissue then of Creatures? Do you think it's great, or? Oh, it's great, no, I mean, it's great. You know, all, all we did, we, uh, see, the drums were so big on the original Creatures that it kind of sacrificed the rest of the, of the, uh, instruments mm -hmm. and and i loved it you know but it, it didn't you know i didn't want to do anything to hurt the album and so what we did is that we uh remastered uh, the album and just rolled off a little bit of the low end on some of the tunes so that the kick drum wouldn't you know sound like uh, the i love it loud cannons you know mm -hmm. all the time uh, it, it would make the rest of the track sound a little bigger and then i think creatures of the night i think was remixed also mm -hmm. and, and i heard you know the remix cassette and it sounds great. I mean, it really, really sounds good. The The character of the album is still identical. I don't think you'd even know the difference. But just some of the low end is rolled off so that things are clearer now. You know, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, big drum, uh, kick drum swallowing up the bottom end. So, and I'm really happy with it. You know, I'm glad that it's being reissued because that album got, got a really bad deal because it came right after The Elder. And, you know, people I don't think knew what, what to expect with the band at that point. So it didn't, it didn't do nearly as well as it should have, and it's a great album. It really is a great album. Oh, I love it. That's my favorite album. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you. I love it, you know, because I'm really proud of the way I played on it, <laughs> and just the sound and everything else. But the thing I like more, most about it, there was a real sense of purpose on that album, and it really comes through, you know. We, we, we set out to show, you know, to show the new kiss, and that we could kick ass, and this is what we really wanted to do, no more elders, no more, you know, unmasked or anything like that. We wanted to come back and kick ass, and that's what that album did. It just was kind of, it was time wrong, that's all. So when can I expect my autographed copy of it? <laughs> I don't know, pick a day. <laughs> pick a day tomorrow. <laughs> but I didn't even answer your question yet, man, I'm sorry. I, you know, I get off into these little tangents and then I forget. Um, well, it kind of leads right into the next question. How would you compare the new album to Animalize? Yeah, okay, well, that, that was like what I kind of started to do with it, the other one. Creatures was, you know, one step that was a step getting the band back into, the, you know, moving our asses and, and kicking it out again. Uh, Lick It Up was a progression from that, but what we did, you know, we, we kind of tried to get a, not so much more commercial, but instead of, you know, doing something to please ourselves, which is what we did, I think, on Creatures. You know, we really, we wanted this thing to sound the way we wanted it to sound. And then it was almost like, you know, well, fuck everybody else. If they don't like it, it's too bad. You know, this is what we want to do, okay? Uh, but Lick It Up, you know, we went a little bit more, we polished off the sound a bit. The songwriting was still really, really good. You know, we had Vinny in the band at the time, and he's an excellent writer. He really is an excellent writer. And uh, then Animalize, from there, it just took that sound, because the you know, Lick It Up was very successful, or moderately successful, and it was a definite direction that the band enjoyed going into, and it was good for the band, too. And um, so then when Analyze came out, you know, that was just a, a progressive step, a little more polished sound. Um, I think the album is great. I don't know about, you know, some of the songs on the album aren't as good, I think, 
is the stuff overall and lick it up. Mm-hmm. But as far as the total album is concerned, you know, Animalize is definitely, you know, a big step forward. And, you know, of course it had uh, Heaven's on Fire on it, which was, a, you know, a huge hit. And the album did phenomenally. I think it's going to, it'll be double platinum, I'm sure, by the end of this year. So uh, now the new album, what, what, what we're doing, which I'm really happy with, is that we've got a sense of, um, it's almost like relaxed, real fun on this album. But it's not fun at the expense of like some really, really driving tunes. We've got three really, really up tempo things, really ass kickers, two of them are double bass things, you know, through the whole whole tune, like uh, Under the Gun, which I'm really happy about because I love doing that stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, those things, they're great. I mean, they're not just um, exercises and quick playing, they're really, really good tunes. Well, do you have some of the song titles for the album? I'm sorry? I said, do you have some song titles for the new album? Oh, okay, we have, um, <coughs> I do have some. One's called Love's a Deadly Weapon. That's one of the, the uh, up-tempo guys. Okay, well, how about if I give you the ones that Chris gave me? That way you don't have to repeat it, okay? Sure. He gave me Uh, All Night, right. Any Way You Slice It, Who Wants to Be Lonely, Love's a Deadly Weapon, King of the Mountain, and Radar for Love. Okay. Uh, there's one called Secretly Cruel. There's one called Tears Are Falling, which is really, really good. It's a great tune to Paul wrote. It's a, you know, it's a, it's kind of a, it's a mid-tempo thing. Um, the heavens on fire type of thing, okay, but a little bit different. It's a little more intense than that. It's a great tune. It really is. The sound is loaded. We have at least at least four, maybe five things that could possibly be a single. You know, definitely two or three that are that are up there. I mean, we have we have a really really good choice of singles. It's going to be difficult to decide which one to put out first because uh, we do have like really you know a few really really good singles on this thing. Uh, let's see what else is there. I read off the love you said. Okay, there's a song called Run For Your Life that may change. <laughs> that's the other up-tempo thing. That's the other double bass thing. And, you know, it, 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 they're great. I mean, they're really great. I can't think of any other songs that I'm not mentioning. Mm-hmm. Go through it again. How many songs do you have now? Okay, nine. You have nine? Okay, yep. there's one more. Let me think of what's missing. <clears throat> Trial by Fire. Trial by Fire? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, who sings all these songs anyway? Okay, um... Oh, God. You name the song, I'll tell you who sings it. Okay. Uh, all night. That's Paul, isn't That's it? Paul. Anyway, you slice it is Gene. Gene. Who wants to be lonely, Paul? Right. I'm just guessing he's just out of personality-wise. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Love's a deadly weapon, Paul? Um, no, that's Gene. Oh, is it? Yeah. King of the Mountain, that's Gene? That's Paul. Is it? Jeez. I'm yeah. failing to... <laughs> I'm failing to kiss no, quiz here. Paul. Yeah, is it Paul? King of the Mountain is Paul. Yeah. Okay, Radar for Love? Paul. Paul. And Secretly Cruel? Gene. Gene. Tears are falling, that's Paul, of course. Oh. Yeah. Run for your life, Gene. Uh, um, I think that's going to be Paul. That's Paul? Yeah. And Trial by Fire? It's Gene. Gene? Okay, so it's another pretty well evenly divided between Gene and Paul, then. Him I guess, yeah. I haven't yeah. even counted, but I guess that's the way it is. Yeah, I didn't count either. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I guess then, since you haven't decided on a single, then you have no idea what's going to be the video. Um, no, I really don't. <clears throat> okay, really don't. F- the concept for the new video, is it going to be like what Heavens on Fire was, like a live footage, and then I don't know. maybe you know, something think, in between? I think, um, we're best with live footage, you know, but there are, you know, nowadays it's real difficult to just do a video with just live footage, because no matter how how great you are, it'll, it may tend to get a little boring, you mm-hmm. know? so you're better off putting some sort of a storyline or just something that's, you know, um, extra in there. Kind of like I have no idea, you know, what what's going to be done to it, but I would imagine it's a safe it's a safe bet to say that it's going to be a combination of live and, you know, some studio work, some fooling around, or, or a little bit of a plot or something. Uh, something like what you did with Heavens on Fire with the party scene and yeah. Yeah, with you under the table with that well, nice looking blonde. Man. Oh, it looked like it. You oh, and yeah. the, so what was that blonde? Boy, that was nice. Yeah, yeah I know. It was very <laughs> nice. But her boyfriend was a policeman. Uh-oh. Well, that's what she told me. That was like a great line to get me away from her, you know? Didn't she know who you were? that line when they don't want to be bothered anymore, you know? <laughs> Made you go. No, but it was okay. We had a lot of fun. Okay, um, a lot of your fans, you know, were hoping that you'd sing lead vocals on the album. <laughs> me too. Yeah, I guess it was just, um, it just wasn't as strong as the stuff on, that is on the album? Mm, is that why? Well, no, my, you know, my material... Uh, on this one, I mean, I, I had a couple of things that I thought were really good, but what happened is that Paul was really, really inspired, you know, this time. And he's come out with some really, really, you know, unbelievably great tunes, really, really good stuff. So he was churning out lots of good things. 
Gene came up with a few good ones, and then Bruce, you know, now that we got Bruce, he came up with, a, I think it, there's at least three, I think there's three things that he's co-written. And, you know, I think they're basically just musical ideas, you know, parts of a song or or a little melody line or something like that, but he's he's got like three things on there, so between all of that, we really had so much really good material. And my material, the stuff that I came up with this time, wasn't as good as stuff, you know, some of the stuff that I've come up with before. So it just didn't get used. I had one thing that I thought was um, was really good, and Paul started to work on it, and then uh, Gene and I, I was out in L.A. when he was there, and I worked on another thing that was, uh, what's the name of it? I don't even remember the name of it. But, you know, it was cool. It was almost like, a, uh, almost like another All Hells Breaking Loose. Mm-hmm. But that kind of just, you know, it died. And then the one that Paul was working on, he really couldn't figure out a way to, you know, to pull it all together. And that thing was almost like um, Too Young to Fall in Love, you know, Motley Crue's thing. Yeah. It was that. It was that kind of a feel, kind of that kind of chord chording. And, and I really like that one a lot, you know. And I have hopes for that one for the next album. So you really keep up then on a lot of the bands that are around today, then, huh? I'm sorry. I said you really keep up on a lot of the bands that are around today. Well, we all do, sure. Yeah. You know? I mean, if, if anything, you know, Gene and Paul and Bruce listen to a lot more of the stuff that's going on than I do. You know, I really don't uh, listen to the radio or buy records that often. But you know, you when things are really popular, you're going to hear them anyway, no matter where you are. Yeah. So I kind of, I kind of, I'm pretty much aware of you know the the, uh, the stuff that's really, really. Uh, hip and what's really really good right now Motley Crue thing you know I mean I, I like Motley Crue I've liked them ever since I heard their first album on leather records back in 82 and that was when they were still playing clubs yeah. and I always loved it you know I thought the, the sound of it was terrible but you know I thought and I thought the timing was pretty terrible but you know the album itself the material the playing the energy you know it was a really really um, it was a really new sound you know, it, it didn't sound like any other band. Now you've got, you know, h- hundreds of bands that sound like that because they're all imitating it. Yeah. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask is, um, when you've been writing some letters to some of the fans, you said that you had a few surprises on the new album. Yeah. Yeah, what would you say they well, one of the surprises was that I'm not going to sing on it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a, a surprise to me, too. <laughs> no, I don't know, you know. Um, Boy, what would the surprises be? I think the surprise is going to be, how, you know, that this album has got such great tunes on it. It's it's animalized, in, you know, way, way beyond what animalized was. The, um, the sound, everything has been recorded much better. The drums, you know, everybody loves the drums on animalized. I, I was not totally happy with the sound. We had a little bit of a problem with headphone leakage when, uh, when I was recording my stuff. I was listening. Hey, here's a good little footnote if you want to know about Animal Eyes. I, uh, I was listening to myself play so loud through the, f- the phones when I was doing my tracks that I burned up about 10 pairs of headphones, um, two hot boxes, and those are just like uh, junction boxes that go, you plug the headphones into that, and that goes into the, the wall modules. And what it does is just boost the signal, you know, coming from the control room. Mm-hmm. Uh, for people that like to listen to the phones really loud. So they're like little amplifiers. I burned two of those up. They were like flames coming out of those. And and I burned my ears, my bo- both of my earlobes. I got like second degree burns on them from the heat. The sound friction created so much heat on the headphones that, you know, the diaphragms got like little frying pans and they fried my ears. So that's like, you know, people think that it's fun recording an album. It's hell. It's a lot of work, and it hurts. It must have been hell just trying to get the headphones over the hair, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> it was. I had to tie them on, you know, I had this Chinese scarf, <clears throat> uh, Japanese scarf, I'm sorry. You, you've seen them around in the stores, you're wiping with the rising sun on mm-hmm. it. And I used, you know, I used one of those to tie it around my head. But um, what happened with that is that I was listening so loud that when uh, we tried to bring in some of the room mics for the drums, <clears throat> couldn't do it because there was so much leakage coming from the phones that, you know, we had to bring that down. So the, the drums on, on Animal Eyes, you know, don't have as much as much sparkle as they should have had. They're kind of, you know, very um, mid-range and low-range, no, no real bright, you know, symbols on it, don't cut. But this album, you know, it's been recorded very, very well. And, uh, you know, it's going to really sound great. And it, it's got, it's more, it's much more raunchy than... <laughs> than animalized. Uh, there's 
more of a sense of fun on this album. We've got a couple of surprises, a couple of the beginnings of the of the tunes are different, you know. Um, King of the Mountain starts where I was just kind of like warming up to get ready to cut the track, and I was fooling around with the drum, just you know, and it, it got recorded, and we decided to leave it. So you'll hear me just kind of like fucking around on the drums a bit, doing you know some uh, you know Bonzo, Carmine, Alex Van Halen kind of stuff, and then we go into the tune, and that's great. You know we're gonna leave that on there, and then there's another song that starts. I think it's Run for Your Life, but that that title may change. But it's Run for Your Life, where it's gonna start with me, you know, me playing the beat, um, double kick thing, and it's either gonna just start or it's kind of kind of gonna swell up. You know, fade in, and then Bruce comes in, and the whole song just like fucking grabs you. It's gonna knock you out of your chair. <laughs> okay, are you planning to continue to see the sing lead vocals in concert with Young and Wasted and Black Diamond? I certainly hope so. I certainly hope so. If the fans want me to do it, man, they should write in, send those cards and letters. In. <laughs> you know what happened with Young and Wasted is that um, when we were rehearsing for the last European tour before we did the states, uh, we had to you know pick new material from the new album. And Gene, originally we were going to drop Black Diamond from the show. So, you know, I was like not happy about that. I really was unhappy about that because that was my own lead, obviously. But Gene didn't want to sing too many songs in a row. Because it was bad for his voice. A lot of them were very, very high. So, but he didn't want to drop Young and Wasted because it's a great song, you know. And it's a really good live. It works. It always works in the show. So he asked me, you know, if I wanted to sing it. I said, sure. You know, so I sang it and it turned out great. And, but before we went on tour, we decided that it, it didn't make any sense to drop Black Diamond. That song is too important, you know, to kiss. And so we put that back in, so that's how I wound up singing two leads, which was, you know, it was great for me. I was really happy with it. And the, uh, the fans and, you know, everyone concerned, everyone that's heard, heard us play live and heard me do Young and Wasted has really loved it, you know, so I'm, and I'm really happy, you know, I thank them for that. But on the, on the new tour, I, I hope to at least still be doing Black Diamond, you know, and I would love to still be doing Young and Wasted. I don't know. So what songs, what songs do you enjoy playing live? Well, let me think. I love doing War Machine. I love doing, um, music. Black Diamond, I like doing. Cold Gin is one of my favorites. You anyway. like Cold Gin, huh? Yeah, I do. I love playing Cold Gin. Detroit, you know, that's my favorite song, but... It, it's difficult for me to play that, you know, because I'm playing it, I'm not playing it the way Peter played it. I'm doing the, uh, I think on the Destroyer album, when I was listening to it and, and learning the song, I think there was like an echo or something on his bass drums or on the whole drum set. So it sounded like there was double kick in there. So when I was practicing it at home, you know, for, the, for my audition with Kiss, I practiced it with double bass the way I heard it, okay? So, and that's the way I've always played it. And it, it's a, kind of a very tricky pattern for me to do so you know and it's the first song you know so you have to come out there and like really you know kill everybody with the first tune and i'm never quite comfortable with that tune mm -hmm. it takes me a little while but cold gin i love playing cold gin i used to uh i used to love playing firehouse and i used to also love playing uh is that you when we used to do that mm -hmm. from the from uh unmasked mm -hmm. yeah i used to love doing that one when, when i first got in the band we were doing that in the show and we used to do shandy and um, You're All That I Want, I, that's a great song. Great song. Okay, um, how would you describe the new stage show? I mean, is there any definite ideas or plans for it yet? Um, well, yeah, we do have, you know, I, it's being changed all the time, so I can't really even give you an idea. All I know is that it's probably going to be twice as big as the last one. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, the stage is just going to be humongous, uh, drum-wise, you know. I'm working on something now that I don't want to say anything about. In other words, I'm not going to tell you, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about, is there going to be the fire and explosion type thing again? Just like, sure. um, you know, I mean, that, that's, you know, what we're all about. We're not going to make a major statement with that because, you know, when we drop the makeup and, the, you know, the costuming and everything, um, that kind of was part of, you know, of the change, okay? Now, last year, you know, during the last tour, we, we started bringing back some of the pyro and then in, in uh, in the Meadowlands, you know, we really went out, but that was just because it was the last show. You know, we're not going to make Pyro like a major, major part of the show. Uh, at least that's where it stands now, okay? It may change. You know, we do things as as things come up, and we think that one thing is right, and all of a sudden, if it doesn't work, we say, wow, you know, this is not working. We really do need something here. And we'll 
do it. So do you plan on continuing roaming around the stage like you did last year at the Meadowlands? Oh, yeah. In between songs? Oh, forget it, man. They're going to have to, you know, they're going to have to, like, have somebody grabbing me and pulling me back. I refuse to stay behind the drums through the whole show. Forget it, you know? I mean, the kit's so big, and this kit's going to be bigger anyway. And, you know, I'm so little. And, you know, it gets boring back there, you know? It really gets boring back there. So I like going out and just hamming it up. I love it, you know? I think it's a, me doing that and, you know, even Gene kind of, I mean, you saw it, you know, he dropped his guard also and, you know, he would laugh and have a good time and walk around and play with the people and Bruce would come over and they'd both come up and, you know, talk to me on the ramp and stuff. That is something that the band can do now that it, it could really never do when it was uh, kind of, you know, locked into the characters with the makeup and everything. Everybody basically had to stay in character and there just was no room for that. But since we dropped the makeup and, you know, we've got Bruce in the band and everybody's really happy and we really, we're really enjoying what we're doing, you know, it's like, hey, fuck everybody, you know, let's just have a good time up here. Okay. And that's what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> is there any reason why Kiss isn't touring Europe or the United Kingdom this year? Mm, I don't, you know, I don't really know. I don't really know. We may still do some festivals. The, the last European tour was very, very, um, you know, hectic for us. We were averaging five or six nights a week. We were playing a lot. And I think with the, with the venues and everything, the type of show that we do, and the venues that are available to us to play there, it's real difficult to make the tour, to make the tour, you know, meet, uh, make ends meet and, and make sense for us to do that. So if we don't do it, if we don't do a, an extensive tour of Europe, we'll do some festivals. Well, do you ever see Kiss going back to like Australia or Japan? I, you know, I tell you, it's something really weird happening because we're starting to get lots and lots of fan mail from Japan. Yeah, and you get, we're getting a lot from Australia. We're getting a lot of members. Okay, see, I haven't, it hasn't gotten to me yet as far as yeah. I know. Well, we get them from people from I'm Australia. A lot. I have been getting a lot from Japan. All of a sudden, within the last three months, there's, you know, it's kind of like starting to happen. And I, as a matter of fact, I was talking to Bruce about it last night, and I said, I predict that next year we'll be in Japan. I don't think it'll happen this year, but maybe next summer or, you know, fall, I think we'll probably hit Japan, even if it's for, you know, a week or two. Mm -hmm. I think so. Um, do you foresee a live album any time in the future? I mean, like, soon? Um, no plans. You know, everybody thought that it was going to be a year. <coughs> mm -hmm. You know, but, um, you know, it's not time yet, you know. Maybe next year, you know, maybe a year after that. There will be another live album. It's just got to be like, when we think it's time to just, to just do it, we'll do it. Yeah, how do you feel about, like, your drum solo when you do it on stage? I mean, are you planning on changing it this year, or is there anything that you... Uh, yeah, I always do. I mean, you know, my solo, if, if you've heard me for the last, you know, five years, it started, it's always, it's pretty much the same solo, and not because, you know, I can't think of other things to do, but because it works, you know, because it's, it's always been an entertaining solo. And what it may lack, let's say, in technique, or, or you know, chops or anything like that, it makes up for it because it's easier for the audience to get into it and they wind up responding better, you know, and it's, and it's fun, it's more fun. Um, I try with each tour to, you know, to add something different to it or rearrange the, the, uh, the pieces, you know, put them in a different order so where you have dynamics where it builds to a certain thing and then the stop, you know, where I'll jump up on the drums or anything like that. But for this tour, there was a couple of, couple of things that I played there's a couple of things that I played on the new album that, you know, I kind of like just learned as I was as I was fooling around. And I'm going to incorporate those into the solo. Plus, there'll probably be some electronic drums in my kit. Well, there will be, not probably. There will be some electronic drums in my kit. And maybe some octobons, too. I don't know if you know what those are. No, I'm not much for drums. Yeah, okay, well, Tom makes them. They're like, they're like small concert toms, okay? Like my, my tiny tom. But they're about three times longer than that. So they look like long tubes, you know, almost, oh, okay. like, <clears throat> almost like a cardboard tube that a poster would come in. Okay, that's like the stuff that Alex Van Halen uses a lot yeah. of. Okay. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like that, yeah. yeah. Okay. So and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to add some of those to my kit. Um, it, you know, those things are all like accessories. It, it's not something that's going to be used during, during most of the show. Um, we have, well, there is one surprise. Unless it gets taken out, I'm just thinking about the album. Man. Um, I did some Simmons tracks last night, and Gene just heard, you know, some some overdub stuff that he wanted to do with the drums. So I played on my first Simmons kit, and it was so much fun, man. I couldn't believe it. I didn't think I'd ever enjoy playing on electronic drums, but I was having a ball. I was a little 
junk too, but that's beside the point. No, actually, it's not. You know, it's not in place of the real drums. It's just playing along with what, what I already recorded, and just you know, giving an extra little effect. So that's gonna kind of surprise people a little bit. But you know, it's not like I'm going electronic though. I would never do that, and uh, it'd be silly to do that because you know, electronic drums just wouldn't fit with, with the stuff that we're doing. Yeah. But uh, as like an, uh, an addition to, you know, a cool little part that works with what's there, it's great. So there'll be Simmons, either Simmons or Tom in my kit, some Octavons, probably some more Roto Toms, uh, a different gong, uh, probably three bass drums instead of two. And I'm working on a, you know, some sort of effect for my solo. That, you know, the last thing, I don't know if you remember, when I would jump up on the drums, those two big, uh, yeah, I remember that. columns of fire would come up. That was great. Just, yeah, that was a good effect. Every time. I mean, because they're like so close, but you know. Anyway, <laughs> I want to do something where the whole riser, you know, burns up while I'm playing. But I haven't been able to figure out how to do it without me burning up. <laughs> it's all part of the show. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Now, I have an idea of how to do it where it'll look great, but it, you know, I won't really be in any danger at all. I don't want to set the drums on fire because, um, you know, too many people have done that already. So I want to do something where the whole riser. <clears throat> Oh, that's neat. Well, um, well, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who does play the drums? As far as what? Well, as far as anything. I mean, like, um, I mean, is there any special equipment that you'd recommend or special exercises that they should no, do you know, starting up? No, I would never recommend. I mean, I, you know, I love Ludwig, and, and I'm using the Peisty cymbals now and the Roods and all that. And, you know, I love what I'm using, but it's not for me to decide what's good for somebody else, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and it's also not fair for me to say, to some kid that's just starting, okay, that he should get this and he should get that because it's the best, because drums are very expensive. And, you know, a, a kid that's just trying to learn does not need, here's a bit of advice, if you really want to learn how to play the drums, don't drive everybody crazy for, you know, to get a set of drums, because if you don't have a good set of drums, you can't play. I learned how to play drums by listening to the radio and getting books. You may have heard this already. Mm -hmm. Different with drumsticks and finding a different sound for each drum and that's the way I learned how to play and so I, I knew how to play every song that was on the radio months and months before I ever even touched the drum set so if, if the thing is I think you know what I, my advice would be if you really want to play don't let you know lack of money for hardware or a great big set or any kind of you know pressure from anybody else telling you that your drums are shit don't let that get in your way you know if you really want to play, you learn to play, and if you're good enough, you'll get gigs, you know, and you'll make money, and you'll be able to get the drums, and then and that's secondary. Mm -hmm. you know, it's only as good as what you make as what you make it. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to try your hands at? Like um, you expressed the interest in producing at one point. Um, yeah, um, there was a band a long time ago. There was a band. No, there's this band called New York that I saw in Daytona, and they're from Charlotte. South Carolina, how's mm -hmm. that, or North Carolina. Um, I really liked them, and I saw them like a year ago, and I really liked what I heard. They reminded me, in a lot of ways, of old Kiss, and as a matter of fact, they idolized Kiss, you know, so it kind of, maybe it, it was, in, it was in, in there, in their music, and that's what I, I uh, recognized. But I was thinking about producing them, okay, a demo or an album or just an EP, whatever, and they sent me some new material, and I still, ha you know, I just haven't decided if uh, if I think I can do the best for the material. You know, it's not just for me, it's for them also. I don't want to just take on a project just for the sake of doing it when I'm putting somebody else's, uh, you know, they're putting their trust in me yeah. to do a good job. And I don't want to just take it, let's say, for, for money or just because I feel like doing something. If I don't think I can really help them, I wouldn't want to get involved in it. And so I've been listening to the material, I've been trying to work on it a bit, and, you know, and, and help it along. I haven't gotten back to them on it, so I really don't know if they've picked another producer or what. If it, if it does still happen with me, this is the middle of July already, and it would be very soon, because they, they did want to start in July, but they were kind of waiting for me. Uh, as far as anything else, I had an idea for a, uh, a project of my, well, I have a few other projects that have nothing to do with music, and those things have just been sitting for a while because I've been busy with the album and touring and everything else. They're just little little ideas that I've had kicking around for years. One of them is, is a kind of like a rock and roll doll that uh, it, it'll be like real cool, you know. It's nothing. It's just something that you'll see in a gift shop or something like that. But it'll be like so cool that you'll.
you'll have to have one, you know. And I'm hoping, anyway. Well, I love the way you say that. You remind me of, um, uh, uh, you've written several letters to Peter Arquette. Sure. Yeah, and, um, he, he always says so cool. And, um, he yeah. really, uh, he thought it was just so considerate, and as he put it, it was so cool of you that when he wrote your question to ask you something, that you answered that letter. And he says, boy, yeah. he just couldn't believe that. Yeah. And ever since that day, it's just been, you know, Eric Carr is the man's idol. Oh, <laughs> you know? oh, that's great. Well, tell him, you know, tell him I said hello and thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, I try when I get fan letters, it's real, it's difficult. I mean, when I first joined the band, I used to answer every bit of paper that I got, you know. <laughs> and then I went through a period where it just got to be so much that I couldn't answer it anymore. And so I would only answer a few things. Then I got to a point where I wasn't answering any fan mail at all for maybe a year. And then, you know, I just decided, like, to start doing it again this last year. But it's starting to build up a lot now, so sooner or later I'm going to have to stop answering. Because there's just no time. Yeah, or write faster. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, but right now, at least, like, especially the Japan, you know, especially the stuff from Japan and Australia, um, if I see anything from Australia, I will answer it right away because... I'm, it's basically I'm doing like my own PR, PR yeah. work for the band, you know. Yeah. And I figure if, if they're interested enough in the band, I might as well, you know, send an answer. And then uh, definitely for Japan because I've never gotten this much mail from Japan before. So I've been answering people, and the mail, like every week or so, every two weeks, it's like doubling. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's great. You know, so it's something I think something is really happening in Japan uh, through Animal Eyes and Lick It Up. And this album is definitely going to going to really turn things around. So my prediction is that we'll be in Japan next year sometime during the summer, probably. Well, so what else do you see in the future for Kiss, then? Oh, we're just going to keep rocking, man. You know, we're just going to keep playing. I think the band is at a point now where we really know um, what, you know, we're back in control of what Kiss should sound like, no matter what it is. Even if Kiss doesn't sound the same from record to record, it doesn't matter because we, we're still in control of what we want to sound like. We're not taking any outside influence, you know, and we're in command of, of how, how Kiss will be. Um, that's just going to continue as long as we still enjoy it and as long as the fans, you know, want to, want to see and hear the band. That's, that's always going to be there. Um, you know, I think Paul is, is trying to branch out and do other things. You know, Gene has been doing other things. I'm trying to get started doing other things. You know, it's difficult, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm kind of a little bit scared about it because they're big responsibilities, you know. Mm -hmm. In other words, just because just I'm Eric Carr's Kiss, the people are putting their trust in me and willing to pay me money to do things, you know, but apart from the name, once you, once you get past the name, it's the performance that counts, you know. So... That's, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I haven't really, like, dived into doing outside projects because I'm a little bit scared, you know, it's too new. But, you know, I want to do other things. You know, I would love to be able to get in a movie. You know, as a matter of fact, I'm probably going to start taking acting lessons. Yeah, just don't cut that hair. <laughs> I said, just don't cut the hair. <laughs> oh, that was next. I have to cut my hair probably next week. <laughs> you didn't see that? Oh, you mean about Queen's right? Oh, okay, no, I meant, um, did you see what Hip Parader's Heavy Metal Heroes printed about you? It was, um, no. they printed, they just had a big issue. It was Kiss versus Twisted Sister. Well, oh, they did? No, I haven't seen it. Yeah, anyway, they had a picture of you on one of the page, and they said, Eric Carr knows that the most important thing a rock star owns is his hair. It was just a picture of you it was from the front of the tour book. Wow. <laughs> and it was kind of neat, you know, oh, just great. I love the way that they just, you know, they kind of just outstood the way, you know, with your hair and everything. Uh -huh. it's kind of neat. Everybody, yeah, well, everybody really relates to your hair. It's like, um... I know. Mm. Yeah, it's scary. <laughs> it is, it's scary. Because I relate to it, too, you know. It's like, I, you know, if I, I can't picture myself without my hair, you know. That's why I want to hold on to it as long as I can. No, but I, I mean, it's it's really gotten, you know, real long. I can, I can grab the, uh... The ends in the back, especially with my hand behind my back, I can grab it. That's how long it is in the back now. Oh, that's great. A lot of drummers, they don't seem to like it real long, but I guess it doesn't bother you then, huh? Well, it depends, you know. It's on, worth the trouble, huh? I'm sorry? It's worth the trouble then, huh? Yeah, and it depends on the type of hair you have. You know, I don't know. My hair, because it's, it's curly and I spray it a lot and I tease it, if it flies around, it still stays up. You know, if I had long, straight hair, I wouldn't want it as long because when you move your head around, it's going to fly in your face and just get stuck there. So I know that feeling. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, it's me. But um, but I don't know. You know, I love my hair, and it just ma it makes it. There's a little more animation going on there. When I toss my head, if I had short hair, you wouldn't see.
see as much movement as you do if I toss my head and you see this big head of hair following it, you know? Yeah. So it just kind of, uh, it makes it a little more exciting <clears throat> to watch, you know? And it makes, like the, it makes the rest of the guys jealous, huh? <laughs> I think so. I think so, yeah. So, you know, I have to cut. I mean, no matter how much I cut, it'll never be short enough for, you know, everybody else's taste. But this is, this is one of the things that we always, you know, kind of uh, grade against each other about, you know, is the hair thing. But they, you know, they know how I am, and, and they realize, you know, that I like my hair, and that I've got a good head of hair, and people, and people like my hair. But I've just kind of, you know, I got to, I think actually they're doing me a favor when they bug me about cutting it, because if it was left just up to me, I would never cut it. Yeah. You know, but at least I have somebody constantly reminding me to cut it, and then I get a haircut every now and then, you know. Every now and then. Huh? Every now and then. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good. That, um... Jeez, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> well, do you have a message for the fans? Yes. Buy the album. <laughs> buy the album. Besides um, buy the album. Buy the album, see the tour. <laughs> no, I don't know. You know, I just, just, I just want to say, you know, that I think uh, that Kiss loves all the fans. You know, we think they're great. Uh, we're really happy that everybody's sticking with us. And uh, we're going to be there, you know, as long as everybody wants us to be there. And, uh, we, you know, we enjoy rocking for them. Yeah, but by then your hair is going to fall out because you're going to be so old. <laughs> this is true. Yeah, this is true, dude. <laughs> yeah. It's going to happen, man. So what else would you like the fans to know about you personally? I mean, anything? Now, with what we're doing with the Kiss Force, it's taken off tremendously. Um, our publication, we have over 800 members. Right. And Keith estimates that about 8,000 people read the newsletter. Wow. Between people who Xerox it for their pen pals, people who show it to their friends, uh -huh. people who write to us and ask us for issues and we send Wonderful. them issues. And um, is there any way that, I mean, oh, you know, like with that tour book giveaway, there's 10 tour books you guys signed? I didn't know that. Well, you signed 10 of them. <laughs> yeah, it says uh, Eric Kerr. Oh, I, I must have. You know what we do usually whenever we're in the office? <clears throat> No, that what they'll do is that they'll, you know, if, if I come in, because we don't always come in that often, I don't come in very often at all, yeah. they'll, uh, <clears throat> they'll just hand you like a big bunch of tool, tool books, and you'll sign maybe, you know, 60 or 70 of them, and then you just leave them there. Yeah, well, they send them. You know, in case things happen like that, you know, for a giveaway or anything, they're already signed, they don't have to worry about it, so that's probably what happens. Yeah, I was going to say, no, they sent 10 of them this way to us, uh -huh. and... Uh, so far, the membership kits, they've been out, I guess, about a week. 770 is the last count on the postcards that I've gotten, and that counts what I got today. Wow. And, I mean, that's only for 10 tour books. That's great. You know, I, yeah, it's fantastic. So hopefully, you know, when we present that to Chris and we tell him, hopefully he'll, you know, want to do some more stuff. I know somebody said, call Eric and ask him if I can have some drumsticks. Okay. <laughs> you know, because people, um, you know, if it's any way possible, we'd like to give those away. Because, you know, in a concert... You throw out, what, maybe five or six, and... I usually throw away about five or six pairs, yeah, so it's like 10 to 12 sticks, yeah. Yeah, and that's not, you know, and you figure you've got a couple thousand people out there, it's whereas Gene and Paul and Bruce, you know, just throwing out box fulls of guitar picks, oh. you know, and um, it's like the drumsticks, everybody always gets the bad end of the deal, and they finally get it, Christ, everybody kills each other. <laughs> well, I don't want them to do that. Uh, yeah. I remember this girl, I threw a stick... <clears throat> um, she was sitting on somebody's shoulder. She was like about six rows back in the, in the middle. And I tried to get it like right to her. And it was a broken stick. It had broken like right in half. So it was pointy. And I threw it. And I real nice and easy so I wouldn't hurt her, you know, because I have to be careful of that. But the kids like reached up in front of her and hit it with their hand. And it slipped back and hit her like right in the face, right between the eyes and cut her face open. And... She, you know, I saw her, like, after the show, and she had, like, stitches and, you know, everything. I thought she was going to sue me, you know. But she was happy. I mean, she didn't care, you know. Oh, it's, it's a privilege to walk around and say, Eric Carr gave me that. <laughs> stitches, yeah. What he, a man. Yeah. What a guy, you know. What a guy. Oh, uh, let me tell you, people appreciate it. You know, like, when you write back to them. Yeah. And, um, I mean, everything. I mean, it's just like, um... I know people are going to be absolutely amazed when I tell them, you know, Eric called me yesterday, let me know he's doing the interview today, uh -huh. and then he was a little late. And, you know, I mean, you didn't have to be that considerate to call and say, hey, I'm going to be a little bit late. Right. Most people wouldn't have cared they would just been late. I know. And, well, um, I felt bad because I, I didn't go to bed until like 7 o'clock this morning because I was out all night and I'm still drunk. Yeah, was she nice looking? Uh-huh. Was she nice looking? Me? No, she, the girl that you were with last night. 
No, actually, I was with no girl. That's too bad. Because if I was, I wouldn't have called you at all. <laughs> but I kind of like, I woke up, you know, like at 10 to 12. All of a sudden, something woke me up, and I said, holy shit, I forgot, you know, here I am late. So I staggered to the phone, you know, and that was the first, you were the, like the first uh, coherent thing that I've done today. It was that first call that I gave you. But sure, you know, I mean, nobody likes to be told that they're going to be called, you know, or make an appointment, and then the other person doesn't show up, you know. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's good. You know, like I said, I mean, I think it's why a lot of people really like Kiss, because these guys do show a genuine concern for everybody. Yeah. It's not, um, you know, well, I'll call them tomorrow. You know, yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's always like the fans are first. Yeah. It's just like, um, uh, you know, asking for autographs. I know there was a big thing. I don't even know if you've read it, because I, I don't know. Do you read a lot of the rock magazines? Not anymore. Not, not, unless I'm in it, I won't. <clears throat> Yeah, there's, um, Cream had a big thing where people were writing in and cutting these guys all down. Really? Talking to, well, one guy said that, you know, Gene, he went off about the wig on tour. I mean, uh -huh. I mean, Gene wore that for the fans. I mean, I mean, that's the way, the way I view it is Gene wore it because you don't get up on stage looking like a movie star. You get up on stage looking like a rock star. Yeah. And, um... You know, he did that for the fans, and some guy said something about when he was backstage and went to take a picture of Gene. Gene threw a bag of cookies or something over his face, so the kid wouldn't take the picture. Yeah. And the kid really got off on that. And I mean, I, you know, I actually knew the kid that wrote the letter because the kid called me, he was telling me about it. And I said, what kind of nut are you to say something like that? Because, you know, you always ask somebody's permission before you do something. I mean... That's why, no, that's, that's why Gene probably reacted that way. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't necessarily, he really doesn't like to have his picture taken all the time. And he really doesn't. He finds that like a personal, it's almost like, you know, reaching your hand in his pocket. You know, it's like you don't do that. You're taking something away, okay? Yeah. And I understand the way he feels. You know, I'm a little bit more open with that. It doesn't really mean that much to me. But Gene gets annoyed sometimes, and definitely, you know, you don't like it when somebody tries to take your picture and, and they didn't ask you. Yeah, well, it's like, um... There was a little comment about you, too, about that you call Queens like fags or something. No, you know, I heard about that, and I felt so bad. I felt so bad about that. I, you know, I was going to, I have their, their number and everything. I had uh, Roseanne from the office call their manager. She said that they had already seen the thing. They laughed at it. They didn't believe it. Okay? Because I love those guys. Yeah, well, that's what I explained to the, you know, the guy who wrote that, too. I says, you know, I says, you can't take everything that people say. You know, literally. Yeah. I says, Eric's got a sense of humor. Yeah. And I says, for him to say, ah, oh, these guys are a bunch of faggots, they're going to fucking hate you. Uh -huh. I says, that's just his way of kidding around. I says, yeah. it's anybody's way of kidding around. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny because I figured what probably happened, if anything at all, you know, we, we have this like running kind of uh, joke that we always do to anything, you know. So I probably was talking to somebody backstage, if, if at all. I mean, I don't even think this happened, but it, it might have. And I said, oh, yeah, you know, these guys are great, man. They're so good. I love the way they play. You know, they're dynamite. I like to watch them. I love the songs. Blah, blah, blah. Jeff's got a great voice, you know. And I'm going like that. You know, they're a bunch of faggots. And that's probably the way I said it, okay? Just like joking around. You know, after this big buildup, you know, I'll just say, yeah, but, you know, they're faggots. And then I'll laugh, and then that'll be the end of it. But probably somebody took that the wrong way, okay? If I even said that, because I don't remember doing that. Yeah. But what I do remember is that, um, I mean, dozens of times, anytime I talk to any of the fans, anytime that I did radio, or any kind of interviews, and they asked about the opening act, you know, I always said how much I love those guys. Always, because I really did. You know, they're really a nice bunch of guys. They're real friendly. They're not pretentious. You know, and, and they're hell of, you know, they're great musicians. I mean, just got a great voice. Um, the backgrounds are great, and their musicianship is, you know, is like excellent. It's excellent. I mean, I get off on just listening to how well they play together and how well they play separately. They're just, you know, it's a fantastic band. Yeah, well, that's great. You know, that's just what I said. See, people, when they hear things or they do things, some people just don't do it in the right way. Yeah. You know, and I guess that happens. I know, um, you know, I've gotten things from people, and they just didn't understand it. Um, and the latest issue they had about the Ace Frilly thing being arrested, and I got a letter from his mother, and she just didn't read the article for what it was. Uh. And it was like, and I called her, and I said, you know, hey, that came directly from Ace's manager. <laughs> Yeah. And she was, really? <laughs> you know? And it's just, it, people really get their lines really crossed off. I yeah. don't know. Oh, did you get the birthday card I sent you? Um, I'm sure I did. I know I got some stuff from you, yeah. Thank yeah. you. I just don't remember now, man. Okay. Like, I got a lot, and I, you know, like at this second, I can't really think of too much. <laughs> Please forgive me. Well, that's okay. My birthday's in August, okay? <laughs> uh, all right. What is it?
Yeah, I can tell everybody I got a birthday card from Eric Carr and a set of drumsticks, autographed creatures and a night album, the whole works, you know. When's your, when's your birthday? <laughs> the 10th. The 10th? August 10th? Yeah. Be 20 years old. How much? 20. Jesus. Yeah, I'm getting old like you. <laughs> well, I'm not quite. <laughs> I just hope my hair don't fall out. <laughs> yeah, it won't. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So what other kind of stuff would you like us to see us print now, the issues? I mean, we're improving, we're actually going to expand the issues to 12 pages. Uh-huh. And, yeah, um, I read that and I heard about that, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, what else kind of stuff would you like to see in here? I mean, I want to dedicate the extra space to, I mean, the band that is now. I mean, people want to read about, they want to read about Ace, they want to read about Vinny, they want to read about Mark and Peter, but... You know, I tell you, for me personally, all right, I don't know how good it is, you know, for the band, but I would, I would tell you, um, if you're going to print stuff about me, anything that's being printed about me, okay, I would like maybe to see a little bit more background information on me, mm -hmm. only because of the fact that a lot of people, you know, I, in other words, a lot of people are not really aware of the fact that I've been with the band for five years, and that I've played, you know, on every album since since The Elder, and that I've written songs, you know, for the albums, that I've written a, a song, you know, a co-written song with Brian Adams, you know, that kind of stuff. See, in other words, I haven't, you know, I haven't really... Uh, done anything as far as writing is concerned or anything like that on you know on this last album so it's kind of like died down right now even though we're getting all the publicity but i've done a lot of stuff in the past so for, for me personally you know it would be great if you could do a thing about me and then do a little bit more of the background stuff that I, that's happened since i've been in the band that would make me really happy mm -hmm. and it would help you know it would definitely help the fans know a little bit more about me because i don't you know i don't know how much people know anymore i really don't know yeah well, that'll probably be, um, I know that was what I was thinking about asking you is when I started the interview, it's like some background information about, you know, your birthday, your birthplace and all that other right. kind of good stuff. But I figured that's, you know, July 12th and you were born in Brooklyn, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. I just, and, um, you know, I guess I just assumed that most people knew, but I guess, you know, we'll kind of start off the interview before I go into it, a little paragraph about it. Then. Yeah, I mean, it's not, <coughs> even, not even so much of, you know, the, the statistics. Mm -hmm. You know, as far as like where I was born, blah, 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 that, you know, joined the band in 1980. Just what you've done with the band. Yeah, that, that's what I think is missing. You know, for me personally, I think that's what's missing, because I don't think people realize that, you know, that I've been writing through this whole thing, you know, that, um, that I've played on these albums, that, you know, I've toured in the States with the band in makeup. A lot of people, I don't think, you know, even know that I was in the era when there was still makeup. I mean, I was in the band with Ace yeah. for a while, so we did play. We did a tour of Europe and Australia. And uh, then, you know, we did that whole tour with Vinny in makeup, the first tour with Vinny in makeup. So I think maybe uh, some of the fans might not even realize that I was around for the makeup. I think they just kind of relate to the new band and me as far as like Lick It Up, you know, from Lick It Up on without the makeup. And that's all, you know, nothing, nothing, really, nothing really major, but that would make me happy, definitely. Yeah, okay, well, that sounds good. You know, you, know the you make it interesting. <laughs> Make you sound like a good guy. I wrote an article. It's going to appear in the new issue. And, um, you know, earlier when you said something about, you know, you being so small behind that massive drum kit, somebody said, you know, you're not really going to print that about Eric because it was something about um, actually, like, touching on each of, each of you guys. And, um, you know, I tried to touch a little bit on everybody. And one of the things I said about you is um, you were, like, the last person I hit. I know, always the last guy and the guy they figured about. But, um... Yeah, it was, um, I just put, like, Eric Carr completes the KISS lineup, and I put, he's the little guy behind the massive drum kit or something like that. Mm. Nah, cut that out, huh? Cut that out. I don't like it. <laughs> well, then I put something about, um, something about your drumming style. I just put something about it. it sounds like a combination of thunder and lightning, or, I mean, how would you describe your drumming? What I would do, what I would do is say he's the little guy behind that massive drum kit that refuses to stay back there during the show. Mm -hmm. That's what? much more interesting. Yeah. All right. And then you maybe, you know, just like add another, you know, add that extra little thing about the fact that during the shows, I'm always out from behind, the, you know, Eric Carr's the guy, you know, behind that massive jump kit, but somebody should tell him that, you know, he's got to stay behind them to play them instead of walking around the stage. You know, something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, because then it's funny. People that have seen us live will know what you mean. And it's kind of cool. Okay. So how would exactly would you describe your drumming style anyway? 
I mean, if you had to relate it to something, um, when Creatures came out, Crying had that big thing. It sounded like cannons and battleships. And yeah, and I sounded like a Marine uh, drum corps or something like that. Oh, that was screwed up circus. What can I you... Know, I didn't <laughs> care. You know, I really didn't care, you know. It didn't matter to me. I mean, yeah. it worked for the album. It was perfect, you know, and it was, it was me playing. You know, I was using my ideas combined, you know, Gene and Paul helping me out, which we always do, and everybody, you know, comes up with ideas for everybody else. Oh, as a matter of fact, I played bass, I don't know if you knew that, on I Still Love You. Oh, that's neat. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, see, that's another, that's like another one of those things that people don't know. You know, I play, yeah, I played bass on that. Mm-hmm. Well, you play... Uh, I, I played uh, drums, the drums for uh, Legends Never Die on Wendy Williams' album. Mm-hmm. Okay, those drums were recorded originally for the Creatures of the Night album. But, you know, we, didn't, we never used the song. But when Gene was, work, you know, looking for material for Wendy, he came up with that song again, and he changed the, the title of the song to, uh, it used to be When the Legend Dies, and then he changed it to Legends Never Die. So we used those drums, those drums and the acoustic guitar we recorded in 82 in L.A. Oh, I didn't know that. I figured you guys just all got together while Gene was producing it and just decided to do a little no, song. No, those drums were recorded th- three years ago. In L.A. Oh, it's interesting. to yeah. find out stuff like that. Uh-huh. Um, did you co-write a song with that Ace is currently doing? I don't know if you've heard any of his material. Yeah, yeah. you know, that was funny. There's a, a fan, his name is Vinny Garcia. He's a, I don't know if you know him. Uh-huh. Uh, we call him Fat Vinny, you know, because he used to be very, very, very heavy. And I first met him back uh, behind the Palladium in New York while I was rehearsing for the first show when I joined the band. And, you know, he's been a fan for years. And he told me, I saw him, you know, a month or so ago, and he told me that he saw Ace perform, you know, at Lamar East or Lamar, whatever it was. And he, and that's how I found out that Ace was using a song. It's called Breakout. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was a song. It was a riff. Dun, 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 dun. You know, all the music, unless he's added something else to it, but all the music on that was something that I wrote back in 81, and that was going to be on The Elder. That was something that I wrote for The Elder. But, you know, Ace worked on it with me. We did demos of it and everything, and he was trying to put lyrics to it. We just couldn't. As a matter of fact, we recorded it. We did some recording in uh, Toronto at Phase One. Okay? Uh, and this was like we did five tunes that were like preliminaries to The Elder. None of them, I don't, I don't remember, but none of them ever wound up on The Elder. They were just like five tunes that we never used. That was one of them that we did. Yeah. Okay, no vocal, just a, just a music track. Yeah, well, that tape did get out. It's been I'm out. Sorry? I said that tape has made it to the public. What, Ace's tape? Yeah. I don't, I don't, what is this, you mean a live tape or what? No, the actual tape that you're talking about that you recorded five songs, all instrumentals. You're kidding. It's actually, that's how, you know, I found out because somebody sent me a tape of it. It's not a good quality tape. Oh, and then and it's got a terrible drum solo part in it too, which I hate. Yeah, that's like the very last track that's on there. Uh-huh. Yeah, wow. it's, um... A World Without Heroes, which is totally different than what's on the album. Yes, that was the original of it, yeah. Yeah, Don't Run, which is with lyrics, you know, which is Dark Light. And yeah. then it's The Breakout, and then it's uh, two other songs. Wow. Which the last one has the drum solo in it. Interesting. It's interesting, some of the stuff that made it out there. There's a tape floating around. I personally haven't hear, heard it or seen it yet, but it's um, Lick It Up outtakes. Really? Uh, I think somebody said it had Shoot the President on it or something. Shoot the President? Yeah. No. You could, no, that's absolutely no. That's crazy. I don't know. Somebody said it's out there. I've seen it on some lists. Well, on I'm sure it's out there, but yeah. you forget about the title or anything like that. We would, we never did anything like that. Yeah. I don't know. That was a title that was floating around at the time. Maybe somebody just tagged it to a song. Yeah. But um, they said that, um, th- I think they said something about you was actually on there, which turned out to be Exciter. You know, yeah. What it was, about it? Yeah, he said that that song was actually on there, too. Or it was oh, different. Was on there, I yeah, he's. That's possible. Yeah, well, he said that it's um, it's kind of like a rehearsal session. He says it's all the guys there, and he says you hear, you know, these guys stopping in the middle of songs and talking and stuff oh, like then, that. Yeah, then it's probably it's probably a rehearsal tape from uh, yeah. NIR. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's really weird how some of the things get out that are out there. There know? is one thing. All right, you can mention that thing about Ace's song. You know, yeah. That, Mm-hmm. that I wrote the music for that years ago. I have to, you know, uh, you can mention about me playing bass on I Still Love You. You know, I mean, you, obviously, this, if it's not newsworthy enough, you know, just don't do it or save it for another time. But yeah. it's things like that that, you know, I would like 
you know, it, it'll make a more interesting article about me, and I'm sure it's things that people don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, because it, it wasn't, I didn't get credit for it on the album, it was just, you know, I just happened to have the best feel for the bass part. Gene tried it first and Paul tried it, and they just couldn't really lock in with the drums. You know, and I sat down and, and I just like did it right away because it was me playing with, with myself. And, you know, and it was great. I was very proud of that. I was like really happy you know, mm-hmm. that I got a chance to do that. Yeah, well, I mean, whatever you want in the article, I mean, it, it, it's about you. I mean, it's for you, so I... You know. There was something else I was going to ask you. Now, we were talking about this and stuff like that. Oh, what you can't... This, I'm, being, I'm getting letters now saying, first of all, that people have a, a bootleg of the first band that I was in before Kiss. Um, I oh, okay. I don't remember who it was that sent that letter to me, but I sent them an answer yesterday. I mailed it all out. I want to get a cassette of it because I want to see what this band is supposed to be. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Um, you were in no other bands, or at least you didn't record with anybody prior to Kiss. I did a little bit of recording, but it wasn't like real album stuff or anything like that. You know, mm-hmm. I, I kind of, you know, got uh, lucky little situations every now and then, which any musician will get sooner or later. They'll be in a studio somewhere. Okay. But it was never, I never was like on an album. Or I never recorded with a band that you know that was doing something that actually put anything out. Nothing like that at all. I'm basically just a drummer that played in bar bands for 19 years, you know, and uh, and just kind of like went from the gutter to the top of the mountain, you know. Yeah, well, there's um there's a tape floating around has two songs on it. Somebody gave me. That's what I, that was what I was getting to. Yeah, somebody gave me the actual title of the band that did it i honestly can't remember but the two songs were rock me slowly and wet and wild it's not me yeah somebody that's, that's what i wanted to ask you i wanted you to write that that down emphatically no way i don't i have no idea what the songs are mm-hmm. you know it's not me it can't be yeah somebody had said something about barracuda which i know you wrote a letter back to him and told him no Matter of fact, that was an honor for me. The guy sent me a Xerox copy of the guy from Holland. Uh-huh. And um, we, specific, we specifically said that you knew who I was. And, right. you know, that was just a great honor for me. Oh, you know? okay, great. Well, that ended up in one of the letters hanging on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, people come over and say, yes, I really do know him. <laughs> yeah, I definitely didn't do that. You know what I should do? I should release a bootleg of, a band that I, of the band that I was in right before Kiss, because I have it. Mm. It's a good tape, too. Make some money, huh? <laughs> yeah, make some money. <laughs> make some no, I mean, I can kind of like just leak it out, you know, maybe I leak it out to you, you know. You leak it out to anybody. Make some money. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, what, the way things go out and around, it's um, it's really tough. That's what I told people. Um, I've gotten some letters from some people who doubt some of the things that we print. Right. And I usually try to get a hold of Chris before I print anything because um, it's like when Mark St. John was out of the band, you know, when that little you know, changeover happened when Mark had, you know, had to leave. Uh-huh. Um, when I had called the management and asked about it, I believe it was Lauren on the phone, and she didn't even know anything about it. Uh-huh. And it's, it's kind of hard when things like that happen, because, you know, you yeah. want to talk about it, and it's hard when you get the story straight. Uh-huh. I mean, I'll be honest with you, um, I talk to Mark all the time. Right. And um, after talk, doing the interview with Bruce, I am just so glad that Bruce is the one in the band. I mean, um, a lot of people seem to think that Mark is like, you know, the big guitar extraordinaire, which, you know, he's a good guy. I mean, he, he plays some really good guitar, but I just think Bruce fits so much better with the guy. Yeah, I agree. You I know, personality-wise and attitude and everything, it's oh, just... Yeah. You know, that was, I, you know, to be honest with you, and, you know, that was a major consideration that we had. You know, we had had problems with Mark even before he ever took the stage with us and while we were doing Animal Eyes I mean as soon as he had joined the band we were already sensing that there was a problem because of the fact that I think he was just overqualified you know yeah it's one of these people that you know they're, they're so good that it's, it's almost impossible for them to be in a situation where they're around people that are as good as them or that can stimulate them so what, what it happens is that they you know they get a little arrogant they get a little derogatory you know and which was which was what was happening you know well i think he's passed a little <laughs> well no i'm saying at the time you know there was yeah. one incident that happened while we were doing animal eyes uh gene offered offered mark a chance to play bass on exciter that's what it was and you know because just to make him feel good and because uh, he was fast enough to do the part okay um and he was doing it and i was sitting next to him in the control room and gene was right next to me and he played like a passing note going into a verse coming out of a chorus and then he stopped the tape you know to take a rest and i said you know that there was a note in there that sounded wrong and and you know he started he got really like defensive and arrogant right away 
And I said, look, I understand, you know, I, I play guitar, I understand music. I said, the note itself may be the correct note that fits, you know, passing through the chord. I said, but to my ear, it sounds like a mistake. People may think it's a mistake. And, and quote unquote, he goes, how the fuck would you know? You don't play the drums, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, okay? And this is after being in the band for like three weeks, you know? Yeah. And Gene just like almost fell out of his chair and he tried to be uh, real nice and, you know, diplomatic about it. I walked out of the room because I was going to kill Mark and I didn't want to touch him. Uh, and I went in the other room and then Gene came in like two seconds later with his mouth and his eyes like bulging out of his head. We couldn't believe it, you know, but it was kind of like building up for a while. So we pulled him into the room, me, Gene and Paul, and we let him have it. And he changed after that. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I know I'm doing an interview with Mark next week uh -huh. for the issue. And, um, I mean, personally, I sat down and wrote him a letter and told him how I wanted him to act. <laughs> because I've talked to Mark, and he's mentioned so much, and it just, he makes every, he tries to make everything sound like the worst possible. Uh -huh. And, I mean, like I explained to him, is, I mean, people are writing to him and telling him that his guitar work is absolutely, you know, the most fabulous thing they've ever heard in their life. It is great playing. Yeah, and they're telling him just how good he is, and the first thing he says to me is, my best stuff ended up on the cutting room floor. Uh, and I said to him, I says, you know, I said, I said that's you know, stupid of you to say something like that. I yeah. said, if, if people are writing to you and they're telling you how great you are, judging by something that you did on an album, and if you think you can do better, great. But if the fans think that you're this great for what you did, I says, then, I mean, that's fantastic. You should appreciate that. I understand, I understand how he feels because, you know, the same thing happens to me and the same thing really happens to everybody. But, you know, um... Sure, because there's a lot of stuff. Any you know, any album that is, that has been out, except for maybe, except for actually this new one, because I'm real happy. You know, there, there's still a lot of stuff that I could have put in that I wanted to, that I had to like, you know, get rid of because everybody thought things are too busy. You know, and sure, I wasn't happy about that, but whatever fits best with the song is what what really counts. And you know, even with that, I'm still like really happy with the stuff that I played. It's me. You know, there's really really good parts. Uh, the playing is very, very good on this album. I really, really played, you know, very well. I'm happy with what I did on this album, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but, I, so I understand how Mark feels about that, but, you know, he shouldn't, you know. Yeah, well, that's Mark... kind of like typical of his attitude about the whole thing. He resented, he resented the fact that he was going to have to be part of a band instead of a star. Yeah, well, Mark's working on his own thing now. I know. He, um, it looks like... He wanted to release an album of his demo tape, the one that he sent to you guys when he joined. Uh, and, I don't remember. Yeah, I don't know. I've never, personally, I've never heard it. Keith told him that we could do that for him if he wanted to. Right. And Keith sent him a big contract, you know, he had our lawyer draw up a big thing for him. And, you know, Mark got a hold of it and they've been sitting on it for a while, uh -huh. you know, while he's working on another album or something. Uh -huh. And, um, yeah, he just seems to think everybody's going to buy that album when it comes out. And, well... Yeah. It'll probably sell, you know, it'll probably do better because of the fact that he was with Kiss, and that's it. You know, whether it's going to be a huge thing or not, I don't know. Yeah, well, that's one of the things I explained to him is, um, you know, you can't be cutting on a band that gave you your big break, that gave you a name. Sure, and he's and exploiting it at the same time, and Vinny, Vinny is doing the same thing. Well, Vinny's a little bit more, um, he's a lot more nicer about it. He doesn't cut these guys down. No, but he yeah. still exploits, you know. But yeah. I, tell you, I mean, I like Vinny. I did like Vinny a lot, you know. I, I can like him better now that he's not in the band than I did when he was in the band because there were just too many too many things that weren't right, you know. Yeah, well, he uh, just signed a record contract, or he is signing a record contract, you know, within the next couple of weeks. Oh, no, I, yeah, I knew, I knew all about that, yeah. And, and the thing about Vinny, see, Vinny is much more talented overall than Mark is. Yeah. Vinny can sing. He's got a great voice. Um, he's an excellent writer, and with the proper the proper control of himself, you know, he can play some really, really great guitar licks, okay? But our band, you know, he just was kind of like trying to outdo himself all the time, and he wound up being worse than what he really was. I was listening to Creatures, and, and you know, there's a lot of, a lot of the stuff on that album is Vinny. Yeah. Okay, before he was in the band. And even though, you know, Gene and Paul and, and I helped him through his solos, and kind of, you know, structured them with him. There's a lot of him on there, the essence of his playing. And he was really, really good. I didn't realize how good he was. You know, it just, I, I only remember Vinny from the horrible solos that he used to do live. That's how I remember him, you know. I had forgotten how good he was on the album. 
but he just needs, you know, he needs to control himself. I, I just think it was a bad, it was a bad situation. He, it was a good step for him, but he didn't know how to deal with it, and he thought that he was going to change everything to suit him. Yeah, he's having a hard time right now. I've talked to some people that's actually wanted to try out for his band, uh -huh. and one guy called me, and the first thing he said was, I can't work with him. <laughs> yeah. He says he's got some good material. Um, Vinny, of course, he had a band together, and it all fell apart. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I'm not sure exactly what the story was. He used to call Keith and I almost every day. Yeah. You know, we really talked to him a lot, and um, then all of a sudden he lost contact, and that's when everything started falling apart. But a lot of people have been calling, and they've been trying out for him. Yeah. And like I said, you know, they just said that he's just, he's really hard person to work with, and they said yeah. they... I, I mean, we knew that about him before he was even in the band. We've heard, you know, we heard a lot of things from people that had worked with him. So it's not something new, you know. Yeah. Vinny uh, will only be happy when he's a total control of everything, which is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But even if you're in total control of things, there's a way to deal with people that you make them, you don't make them feel just like, you know, they're workers. You make them feel comfortable with you. Yo, know, I'll say that's one thing that Vinny does with the fans. He makes them feel comfortable. Sure. I know when I've talked to him, you know, he always makes anything that you ask, whether it's a touchy question, you know, he tries to make it sound good. Uh-huh. You know, like I said, when he talks about Kiss, I mean, you know, whether he's lying or not, um, he still makes it sound good. Sure. You know, he... Sure. He makes these guys sound like you're still the greatest band in the world. Uh-huh. And um, I think that's really good. It is. You know, it's just like, um, I heard a story yesterday. Somebody called me who was once dating Vinny. Uh -huh. And the girl said, yes, yeah. he says, um, right after you guys fired him or something, Ace really called him and told him it was a good move. Wow. And I just said, well, that's... I figured Ace would do that, you know? Yeah, well, I said, you know, well, that's Ace, <laughs> you uh -huh. know. Well, I know when I met Ace, you know, I was turned off. Yeah. I met him when he was on tour this year. And I was telling him all about what we were doing, and I told him that we wanted to cover him because the fans want to read about him. And he says, I'm no longer in Kiss. Hmm. And he took the business card and threw it across the room. <laughs> and I asked for his autograph, and I left. You know? And his manager ever since then has been really nice to us. You know? Um, George, right? George yeah, George Sewitt. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, he's a really nice guy. Yeah, he used to be on the Kiss's tour manager. Yeah. Oh, he's really nice. I know. Um, I talk to him a lot. And he's setting up, and he's Vinny's manager as well right now. Yeah. And um, he's setting up an interview with Vinny for us and possibly Ace. He sold us the Frilly Comet shirts because uh -huh. we sold those. Goddamn, they sold right out, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, Ace was, you know, pretty hot there for a while, but now, of course, he's having some problems getting the contract. Yeah, I feel really bad for him because he's, you know, I mean, he's Ace, you know, no matter what you want to say about him, he's Ace. You know, it's like Jimmy Page, no matter how good or how bad he gets or whatever he does, he's still Jimmy Page. You know? Yeah. And Ace is Ace, and, and he wished that he would pull himself together and, and do something. Yeah, well, he's, I think what it is is, you know, that big drug thing really hit bad with him. Sure. You know, and that really, that spoiled a lot of things for him. Yeah. So, I don't know, wish the guy luck, too, you know. Yeah. I'm looking forward to everybody coming out with the albums. I think it would be great, you well, know. I think so, too. But, you know, of course, my main concern is Kiss, as always. Yeah. You know. That's it. Well, listen, I better let you go. It's okay. been quite some time. I certainly appreciate you calling. Okay, you know? it's fine, man. You know, just I hope you got some good stuff to print. Yeah, well, I hope so, too. You know, you'll get the issue when it comes out. Okay. You should have your membership kits. Um, Keith told me he mailed them yesterday. Yeah, I think I have it. Oh, you do? I think so. Okay, yeah. Not sure. The actual color picture view, that was supposed to be a postcard. There's nothing on the back of it. Um, well, they well, told right. No, I don't have it, but I got the letter that said it was coming. Yeah. That's yeah, the um, postcard is actually view. I mean, I haven't even seen the kits myself either, but people ask about the postcard. Uh -huh. And I told my sister it's a picture of Eric, and they said there's nothing on the back. Huh. And I asked Keith about it, and he said a minimum order was 50000 for a color wow. postcard. <laughs> well, I, I acted like a smartass, and I said, well, how much does that cost? <laughs> and he told me to go to hell. <laughs> yeah, he's a fun guy to deal with. Uh -huh. And um, I don't know if you know or not, but we have incorporated ourselves in Massachusetts. Oh. And... Um, yeah, well, we've got a lawyer up there. There's actually an office up there, too. You know, Keith goes to the office every day, you know. He has a good time with it. I think, you know, what's keeping us going is, um, you know, we're buying merchandise from, like, Winterland. You know, you're, you know, your official merchandiser. Uh -huh. And a lot of the other people who are selling your stuff. Uh -huh. And that's really keeping us going because, man, we're selling tons of this stuff. I know. You know, it's weird because um, there, there was a store right across the street from Electric Lady where we were recording. They had about 300 tour books in there. And they sold them all within the last two weeks. Yeah, those ones with Bruce are hot. Yeah. You know, yeah, Keith sold out of those three times. Wow. He just placed the fourth order for those to reorder them. Yeah, he orders. Great. Yeah, he's been ordering a hundred at a time. Wow. And um, 
Well, I think what it is is everybody, they're interested in the new band. They're interested yeah. in um, the people that are there to stay. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, the way Bruce talks, you know, and I think just the way he is, it's most obvious he's going to be there, yeah, you know, until, you know, everything's ending, which hopefully, you know, it never happened. Yeah, he's, and he's, you know, he's writing really well, and his, his musical ideas are great, and he's playing some really, really excellent stuff on this album, so, you know, people are going to be really, really happy with him. Yeah, I'm real happy with him now, just, you know, just for seeing the guy on tour, uh -huh. you know, I thought he was really good, and, um, you know. Oh, anyway. sure, let me go, because i got to get out of here. <laughs> okay. Okay? All right, then. Well, thanks a lot. Okay, yeah. dude. All right, take care now. All right, All bye, right. bye. Great, how about you? Okay. Yeah, what's up? You pretty thing or what? No, I didn't. I just got home from work. I was downstairs watching a videotape. Sounds good. So how you been? Okay. Pretty good. I did, um... But there's been a lot going on with us a lot lately, you know? And things... Yeah, yeah things have been moving very well. We sent out, um... Of course, we're doing a fan club for KISS. We sent out our membership kits. We got a call from their manager thanking us. From and from KISS's manager, Chris Lent, the tour manager. Uh -huh. And he thanked us on behalf of the band and congratulated us on the professional job that we did with it. And um, I did an interview with Eric Carr last week. And, you know, it's been really good for us lately. Great. So what's up? I don't know. I'll just have photographs if you wanted. <clears throat> yeah. You want me to send them to the PO or what? Um, I'd rather you send them to the Baltimore address. If you send them to the PO, I mean, I won't. 415 Barley's? Quarters Road. Okay. Uh-huh. No problem. Yeah, if you send them there, you know, and um, do you know when Mark, the best time to reach Mark to do the interview with him? Um, usually around 4 or 5 o'clock in the day, because him and Dave have been, like, heavy tracking on this 8-track studio they got going. Uh-huh. So is Dave? They're going to call it White Tiger. Oh, okay. So Dave is going to be working with him then? Yeah. Did they have any? Okay, well, that's Dave Dave Donato, right? Donato. Donato? D-O-N-A-T-O. Yeah. Uh-huh. And um, so do they have anybody else in the band yet or just kind of screwing around with that yet? What's that? Do they have anybody else in the band? Well, I think he's thinking about using his brother on bass. Mark's brother? Yeah. Yes, yeah, he's, he's another tall dude, but just like Mark, kind of. Mm-hmm. With a local drummer guy named Brian Fox, we're thinking about using. If not, we're going to use uh, that guy, uh, Barry Bryan. But otherwise, these tunes are sounding really killer. Is there any... Um uh, have they contacted any record companies or sent any demos to them yet, or is it we're, too early? We're just doing idea tapes on 8 tracks, and then we're going to take it to 24. Oh, okay, so it's a little early for that then yet. Yeah. So as soon as they well, finish... We, it's, you know, it's just like, just like having the, you know, material. You <laughs> can't tell anything unless you don't have anything, so... Yeah. you got to start somewhere. Yeah, so there's still... nine tunes right now that sound really, really, really big. Mm -hmm. Sounds I good. Think like um, whatever happened with the um, the um, contract that Keith had sent up that way? Um, what on that uh, spotlight tape? Uh, I guess that's what it's called. Well, we're gonna hold off on the spotlight tape. We're gonna do a we're gonna do hits. Uh huh. So at this point, it's like not worth getting into when we can. Uh, to a band situation, because all it is is an apartment tape. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I want to get some vocals going, not just a guitar tape. We can put out a guitar tape anytime. Yeah. We want to put out some Mm-hmm. You know, well, you may want to get back to Keith whenever you get that all settled with that contract, whatever you're going to do with it. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, he handles... Well, it was a good idea at the time, but things are like working together a band thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, it's like... Thinking about taking a cut out of that and put, you know, you know, you know, in the, you know, in the uh, guitar player magazine, they have sound page. Yeah. Thinking about doing a sound page, just one of the cuts of those. Mm -hmm. I don't turn call on that. But for, for now, for now, on the spotlight, it's just like a whole situation. Yeah. Well, I mean, I didn't know exactly. See, I'm not sure what the contract was really for. I know he mentioned that tape, and that was on Mark's suggestion, or at least on Mark's idea. And, um, uh -huh. you know, he had the lawyer draw that up, and I was just kind of curious what was going to happen with it. So, in other words, uh 
the contract is just going to be nothing, huh? Well, it's a good contract. There's some counterpoints to it, but at this point, it's like we're not even going to work with it right now. We want to put together a band, you know, and get something out there touring, you know? Mm hmm Okay, well, that sounds good. You know, in less than a month, we'll be in a 24-track doing some really... But I, I should go go put on one of the solos. You want to you hear one of the solos off one of the songs? Okay. Hold on. All right. Hi, David. Yes. There's Gordy. Hi, Gordy. How you doing? with Mark? Yes. Gord I've spoken with you before. Mm. How's everything going? Really good. You talked to Keith before. Oh, okay. I thought I'd talk with you before. It was Keith then. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I was just asking, I was asking Ed about the contract, and he said that you're not going to, you're just going to let that sit for a while. Until well, yeah, we want to, we kind of want to <coughs> go on hold on that for a while. Um, the reason being is he's spending every day riding about 12 to 14 hours a day, mm -hmm. and we got nine, ten, and since we got 12, we're going to go do the whole thing, self-finance it, do a 24 track. Yeah. Put out our own EP to start with, and then maybe an album. Yeah. So that's going to be just for the next two months. That'll be ready to package. Mm -hmm. these, these tens are incredible. Sounds right good. Now, it's just you know, like a track in the bedroom type situation. Yeah. Got the new a track system, front of sticks. Mm -hmm. Set up all the outboard gear in a full-on studio. Okay, and, so uh, um, it's coming together. Okay, well, what Amazing. what all do you want to put in the issue about it in the next issue? Um. Well, we haven't copyrighted. Uh, the name yet, mm -hmm. and so I don't know what, if that would be advantageous to print that, if that would hurt us or not. Hmm. You know, you have to run a copyright search and those types of things. Yeah, I know. On, 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 um, on the name. Yeah. Uh, you could put tentatively or something like that, that that's the name we're working with right now. Okay. And still David, and they're all original compositions between Mark and David. Killer stuff, great hooks, anthems, rock warrior, Chase the Lightning, all kinds of good stuff. And it's real commercial, it's real, uh, it's real heavy, and it's real anthem-oriented. It's music that people can get into and, and enjoy and get behind. Okay. Um, are the songs, is it cool to print the song titles, like you just said, Road Warrior? And um, Shoot, let's see. Let me ask, uh, we'll have to get back to you. You were going to call Mark for those questions, right? Yeah, well, I want to get back to him on that interview as soon as I can catch him at home. Yeah, he's at home. Hey! That's going to play a couple tracks here. Okay. Okay. I don't know if you want to hear it to this well. This is, this is off one of their tunes, okay? Okay, thanks. All right. 